Hello students, welcome back class. Today we will be going over Warjacks of Kodor. Just a general overview, nothing too specific. Just a general overview of their creation and all the fun stuff that goes with that. Also another thank you to Privateer Press for letting us read their fantastic lore. And as always, if you guys ever need any of their lore for your own particular collections, please feel free to check out privateerpress.com. And let's begin. Warjacks of Kodor. While every nation employing Warjacks has its own approach to their design, nowhere is the favored aesthetic more plainly evident than in the Gadoran Empire. Its war machines embody the priorities and approach to battle preferred by the proud and implacable warriors of the north. Although fewer in number than the machines serving Kadoran's rivals, each Kadoran Warjack is a heavy and massive engine of destruction. Layered in thick armor and possessing brutal direct weapons intended to obliterate the foe, they are machines designed for conquest, perfectly complementing the Kadoran army itself. Kadoran Design Paradigm Over the centuries since the founding of Kodor, the nation's mechanics have designed and constructed a broad array of warjacks, each with its own function and role on the battlefield. For over a century, the Kadoran's approach to warjacks manufacturing has been steadily refined and improved. Yet the fundamental design paradigm has remained consistent. In particular, Kadoran warjacks are built to be rugged and long-lasting, to be quickly repaired, and to continue to function even after heavily damaged. Other nations have created more maneuverable and reactive light jacks to fill the variety of battlefield roles, but Kodor addresses those needs differently. The Empire's heavy warjacks are often compatible to carry out multiple battle functions, and their durable chassis allows them to be equipped with staggeringly powerful weapons. To compensate for the large number of light jacks fielded by its enemies, Kodor has responded with steam-powered man-of-war troops, which serve a similar purpose while being easier to deploy in volume. The man-of-war infantry has allowed Kodor to operate in equal tactical footing, countering cortex-driven machinery with armor-encased manpower. There are significant reasons behind the Kodoran approach to warjack design, especially the decision to forego fabricating smaller light jacks in addition to a general preference for heavier and more robust engines of war, there are important resource considerations. One of the largest obstacles the Kadoran warjack industry has faced is the lack of rare minerals and metals required for Cortex manufacturing. You know, I think the only warcaster you've ever seen running around with a light jack would be the witch, but I think she had to make her own. I, I don't think, I, I'm pretty sure she made her own because that definitely doesn't look like any Kadoran warjack I've ever seen. A cortex is the artificial brain inside every steam jack is by far the most specialized, expensive, and complicated of its system. Each are intricate and many-layered metal spheres. Military-grade cortexes are more sophisticated than their labor jack counterparts. Requiring greater quantities of rare and expensive elements, these resources are relatively scarce in Kodor compared to the southern mountains, and so cortexes are at a premium. It is top priority of the Kadoran military to get most out of every cortex it can produce to ensure each serves as long as possible and is also well protected against destruction in battle. The delicate arc nodes attached to warjacks employed by several of Kadoran's rivals require similar materials and are also costly and time consuming to produce. It has long been Kadoran policy to askew such devices in favor of maintaining military grade cortex production. Also, again, the old witch actually did attach an arc node to her scrap jack. So, again, sometimes just doing it yourself, you can get a hold of more interesting materials for just one. The Grey Lord Covenant, which is responsible for Kadoran Cortex manufacturing, prefers to employ a less advanced Cortex grade than its southern counterparts in the most of its war jacks for similar reasons. The High Command does not deem this strategy as vulnerability as Kadoran Warjack's design focus on simpler weapons and engine systems that do not require advanced cortexes to regulate them. To most Kadoran mechanics, simplicity is a virtue. They perceive some of the designs of their enemies to be heavily flawed due to their reliance on delicate systems with too many moving parts. Nothing gives a Kadoran mechanic more joy than to see an enemy Warjack toppled under the blow of his own machines can endure without breaking stride. There are exceptions to this rule of simplicity, and Kador's arsenal does not include a few machines that utilize more complicated weapon systems. But such machines are highly specific roles, or were created to counter a particular threat, and each has its share of problems, including the need of, for frequent maintenance and specialist mechanics. There is currently a growing divide between younger and older members of the Kadoran Mechanic Assembly on this topic. 
The more youthful engineers believe they must adapt or perish. Many, for example, are eager to reverse engineer some of the technologies of their rivals for use in their own designs, while the more traditional mechanics see this pragmatism as a betrayal to the Cadoran principles. The impact of design philosophies can be seen in a number of ways, some less overt than others. Cador has less variety in its heavy chassis than its rivals, with most of its jacks built on the exact same architecture that has been used for nearly a century, as exemplified by the solid juggernaut. This highly successful chassis was the successor of an old and less robust frame still found among war jacks like the Berserker, the Mad Dog, or the Rager. These aging machines are maintained and continue to serve even past the point when their cortexes have developed dangerous instabilities. And when they say dangerous, they mean dangerous. You run any kind of thought program through that, and the thing could just explode right then and there on the battlefield. Some war casters actually use this as an advantage because then they have a walking boomstick, but kind of wasteful to explode an entire war jack as a strategy. Other chassis types exist, but have been adopted slowly, in some cases incrementally, and only when a clear need is demonstrated. The war jacks built on the Devastator frame were initially intended to shoulder especially heavy armor and support a new integrated weapon system. This is the chassis was created by An Vanar, specifically to challenge the Gadoran mechanic assembly to come up with a new design. The Kodiak, with its powerful expanded engine, was geared towards allowing the warjacks to quickly traverse difficult terrain. While Kodor's designs are conservative, innovation does occur, usually in the form of occasional special projects like the Behemoth. But the majority of Kodor's warjack production relies upon the ease of sharing parts across similar chassis which does make their stuff a lot easier to find mechanics to fix. Just saying, sometimes simplicity does work out. The preference for simplicity over complexity is especially evident in the weapons employed by Kador's Warjacks. These machines wield a number of highly effective mechanical weapons like the Juggernaut's Ice Axe, but even these killing tools are relatively simple compared to the finicky Southern apparatus. So too with Kadoran ranged firepower. Some degree of complexity is required for a functional auto-loading cannon or mortar, but Kodoran mechanics have made these systems as resilient as possible. Similarly, Kodor's warjacks rely on delivering high explosive yields and heavy shells rather than a pinpoint accuracy or extended range. Even the nation's ranged warjacks are engineered to close on the enemy after firing rather than conduct a protracted shooting engagement. This posture affects the behavior and tactics of these warjacks, which are generally aggressive and direct. Logistics and Infrastructure Kodor's newly invigorated infrastructure and military reforms have not had the significant impact on its approach to warjack design. Even with the capture of the resources of Lael, the northern nation still lacks the precious metals necessary for the fabrication of warjack cortexes in large quantities. Because of the scarcity, the Kodoran Mechanic Assembly ruling body, the Mechaboru, Oro, or again, really good at mispronouncing some Kadorn words. Mechaniburu, that's what we're going to call it, continues to allocate most of its resources to the creation of medium grade cortexes intended for heavily armored and highly survivable warjacks. Within the last century, warjack fabrication techniques have been greatly standardized and streamlined, and the Kadorn military industry is now a cohesive and ordered assembly process stretching across factories in multiple cities, each connected by well-defended railways. Different systems and parts are created in far-flung corners of the empire and then brought together and assembled into a fully functional machine of war. The bulk of this work is done by members of the Kadoran Mechanic Assembly headquarters at the Raginvia complex in the capital of Korsk. Other sizable manufacturing centers are located in Kordov, Volingrad, and Skirov as well as a captured former Lely's capital of Marowin. Warjacks are massive machines not easily transported from one place to place. Though the expansion of the railways has facilitated such logistics a great deal. Hodor has proven particularly quick at to lay new tracks across the motherland as well as through newly conquered territories. Stout wagons hauled by oxen or draft horses take warjacks where the rail cannot, and if necessary, the metal giants can travel under their own power, although doing so consumes large amounts of coal and water. Ongoing war has forced the construction of new fire bases, 
forward positions at key points where ample supplies of coal, water, food, ammunition, and weapons are placed for resupply. As the front lines have shifted with the vicissitudes of war, more of these bases have been built to allow warcasters and warjack to strike from wherever they are needed. Some fire bases become permanent fortifications as they expand into a true command post. A network of roads and resupply points stretches from the war front through occupied territories and ultimately to the center of production and industry deep within Kodor's territories. Colossals. The last few years have seen a rise in new challenges and threats, forcing the high command and their Regsvinya complex to adapt. Proving they were up to the task of quick thinking and innovation, the Doran leaders began the emergency project in 608 AR to create the first Kadoran Colossal. The need to develop considerably larger warjacks, each carrying a correspondingly more impressive array of firepower, was in a reaction to intelligence brought by Kadoran spies. Alrighty, and like some of our other readings from the archives, look like we have a little side note here. Kadoran Warjack Service Markers Warjacks that have served in notable battles are often decorated with service markers to denote their length and region of service. The warjacks do not notice such distinctions, but the honors inspire confidence in soldiers fighting alongside them. Uh, first one, we have the Siege of Merowyn. The new Kodoran Empire was born the day Merowyn fell and surrendered to Kodor. And this marker distinguishes the warjacks that fought during the lengthy and difficult battle that crushes the spirit of the Lily's rulers. Soldiers who played important roles in this fight wear the service medal of a similar design. Also, if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, there will be a picture of these. Assault at Redwall. The attack of Redwall Fortress was the most crucial of the initial assaults during the Lely's invasion because the fortification was the strongest western bastion in Lely's and Signaran armed forces. Warjacks with this marker were hurled against the fortress under the leadership of Commander Orsef Zaktavir, also known as the Butcher. Then we have the Fall of Northgard. Although Kadoran forces would eventually withdraw from the Thornwood, the fall of Signar's mighty northern fortress late in 607 AR is held as one of the greatest victories in the last few decades, and the warjacks that survived this clash proudly bear this marker. Alright, let's get back to the Colossal section. Through espionage, Kodor learned that Signar was already well on the way of developing a new generation of Colossals, quite different from the massive but inefficient machines deployed against Orgoth. Taking advantage of modern advancements in cortexes, metallurgy, articulated movement systems, ranged weapons, and other warjack systems, these new colossals were bound to change the face of modern warfare. Had Signar accomplished its goal unimpeded, it might have gained a decisive edge. Given unprecedented support by Empress Vanar, the Kadorn Mechanic Assembly rose to the challenge. Entire factories, once dedicated to regular warjack production, were overhauled and repurposed while the brightest Kadorn minds drew ambitious diagrams and blueprints for the new design. Resources were gathered from across the empire in massive collaborated effort. Through these measures, the first of the mighty conquest was unveiled in record time and put on the field even ahead of the first Signar and Colossal. This achievement clearly demonstrated the capability and resolve of Kodor's skilled citizenry. Other designs such as the Victor would soon follow and each of these mighty war machines has since fought at the vanguard of Kador's army, employed by indomitable warcasters to ensure the ongoing supremacy of the motherland. Well, sometimes simplicity works best, and when you have everybody working on the same project at the same time with full support, you can get bigger things out. And those Colossals and Victor are ginormous. Like, huge, huge. I've seen them a couple times in Battlefield and tell you, they are taller than most buildings. So, they are a force to be reckoned with. Full firepower, all sorts of newly updated guns. And tell you, them just punching something would just clear it off the board in one hit. It's amazing. Alrighty, class. Well, that will do it for today's course. Again, the homework, as always, is please like, subscribe, comment, tell your friends, Tell your fellow gamers about this podcast so we can increase the class size. Another thank you to Private Tier Press for letting us read their lore online and making a little commentary about it. Uh, please leave comments if you have any questions or want to get into anything interesting or if you have any suggestions of stuff that you want to get into in the future. Uh, the following semesters, we will be going over other factions outside of Kodor and Circle Oberos. So, 
If you know what faction you want to get into next, let me know, and I will I will try to do those for you, because I literally have every single archive book at my disposal for this course, so there's that. All right. Well, that does it, guys. As always, class dismissed. We'll see you next week.